That's the goal. One of the effects of this is to, of, of, of this change in capitalist time is to give a new privilege uh, to, to bigness, to shares of size. It's a full pull factor in megacities. The chameleon character of institutions tends to extract value uh, from the places in which the institutions are established, rather than create a regime which is installed, which controls the urban uh, 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 agglomeration as a whole, where it's established, uh, which exerts authority over the city, uh, as well as derives profit from it. And that's a profound change in the relationship of economic institutions to civil society. Uh, put very crudely, in uh, this uh, kind of capitalist organization, economic interests have less and less interest in the civic realm, uh, and particularly have no desire to claim authority uh, over aspects of the civil, civic realm, uh, which exclude their own immediate interests. Now, this is the problem. These create, create we're talking about inequalities of size, and we're talking about a reformulation of economic power. So that power is divorced, if you like, from the questions of, of civic domination. And the question is, what is it that we, poor, poor us, um, as urban designers and planners can do about this. My colleague, uh, Harry Cobb, uh, with whom I talked at Harvard for many, uh, in, in the past, has always said to me, we can't do anything about it. Uh, we are not uh, the um, engineers of, uh, uh, of social malaise, and we can't expect to be its doctors. And I take this opportunity of having traveled 13,000 miles to conduct once again with my uh, debate that I've uh, conducted with in the past. I think we can do something about it. And that the Hippocratic oath that we can take, do no harm, can be executed in this regard. I want to uh, uh, suggest three ways in which this is the case. First has to do with the question of scale itself. One of the diseases of urban design, or the sicknesses of urban design uh, in the last century, was that we found that as there was an increase of scale in projects, that the projects themselves decreased in their social complexity. That is, they got larger and simpler, bigger and cruder. In the urban age, this is an issue that has come up over and over again in many different contexts. It appeared to us first when we had uh, uh, a discussion in London, for instance, about the revamping of a large uh, transport center called King's Cross, uh, in which a very large mega project did absolute violence uh, to the neighborhood in which it was uh, set. It's something that came up when we traveled to Shanghai, and our uh, designer colleagues in Shanghai describe the violence that's being done uh, behind the area of the Bund in Shanghai uh, uh, by very large-scale projects which have simplified what was a very complex in, in environment. Um, the question that's involved here is how, uh, or I should say, when I think about this, when you have a correlation between increasing the scale of a project and decreasing complexity, one of its signal social marks is the evacuation of the people who were in the space before that, problem, uh, that project. Their, their problems are complicated. It's easier to erase them, to evict them, and start over in order to make something <laughs> clear than actually to address as Hippocrates uh, recommends to us uh, the, the complexities on the ground. So what is to be done about this? I think that one way to take the Hippocratic Oath is to use complexity as a measure of quality, which 
may seem uh, a rather vacuous uh, uh, formula to you. It means in particular that we use street grading as a primary measure of complexity in cities. Then whenever we think about renewing, about building, the complexity of street grading becomes our first point of reference. This is an issue that our colleague Amiki Penelosa has put into practice, as I've described to us tomorrow, in trying to remake the streets of Bogota as the pedestrian sites. They're more complicated than the, uh, uh, the, uh, that, than the streets that have existed before. The grain has become richer and more complex. And so, I, I would argue to you that the first way we can take this Hippocratic oath of cities is to use complexity as the measure of quality and conceive complexity in terms of complication of grain. The second way we might observe Hippocrates' oath, do no harm, deals with a, another project, that, a, a problem that we, in, uh, as designers and planners, have encountered as this mobile famine in which is urban, uh, their urban age moves around the world. And it is a problem which I'm going to frame to this I have some little time, and just as an architectural issue. It has to do with uh, the problem of overdetermined form. Often, when we try and make a project very precise, particularly if it's a very large project, uh, we try to define in advance the relation between form and function. Uh, uh, we, 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 we try to make physical objects like buildings which perfectly suit purposes we, decide, we, we define in advance. This produces a phenomenon that I've used a very inadequate word to, to characterize the English, which is brittleness. It means that, that, that objects, built objects that have this capacity, become very rigid, very inflexible. As conditions change in the city, the objects themselves prove resistance to adaptation and growth. That is, they're clear objects, but they're not sustainable. Now, one thing driving this kind of brittleness uh, is the demand made by uh, capital investment for buildings uh, which you can understand and so trade on a market. If you know what a right is, a real estate investment trust. Their, their, their criteria for buying and selling buildings all devolve around the issue of the fit between form and function, driven by the notion that you know what you're buying or you know what you're selling. But in terms of the life of cities, this kind of fit produces something that is uh, 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 inhibits the process of adaptation and sustainable urban age when we began uh, uh, at the very beginning uh, of, our, uh, of our travels in New York to look at the difficulties of the uh, downtown New York financial district in trying to adapt itself uh, to become a, uh, a residential center rather than a financial center. Again, when we were in Shanghai, we heard from our colleagues in Shanghai a lot of anguish about the fact that while Shanghai had moved from being a manufacturing to a service economy city, the buildings that had been put up to serve uh, that, that immediate world of manufacturing proved very difficult to retrofit or to adapt to the world of services. So I would say that my second version of the Hippocratic Oath leads to what may seem to you to be an odd conclusion. That in order to do no harm, we should not fit form and function perfectly. That is, we want to seek for forms which are ambiguous, whose ambiguities mean that change can occur in the physical fabric. The final way in which I think we can become good Hippocratians, 
has to do with issues of public space. And here for me, as a, as a uh, Europhile Westerner, I was very struck by the discussions uh, that uh, I and my colleagues have in both Johannesburg and Mexico City. Uh, what they told us was that basically our thinking about public space applies 20th century models to a 21st century problem. Uh, I'm particularly moved by this by talking to planners in Johannesburg who had emerged from a long period of racial and ethnic segregation um, to face the problem of how do they get their city together. And the challenge that they offered to us was that we needed to think more about the edges of public space and less about its centers. That we needed to think about borders, live edges between different economic as with different racial groups, rather than looking into the centers of community. It was very moving that chief woman was now the chief planner of Soweto said to me, I don't want to look inward any, anymore. I want to look at the edge and see what's beyond Soweto. There's a terrific challenge in, in life. It is by looking outward that we give up some of the mindset that's involved in, central, in, in centralization, which is looking to those parts of public space in which an identity seems uh, fixed or coalesced. The center of the community, particularly the local community, is a place where people who are like each other tend to be massed together to see each other, to recognize each other as members of the same community. While the border condition is one where you lose that kind of definition. Uh, but what we were being pressed to do uh, by our colleagues uh, was to try to imagine a condition in which we put resources and thought about the public realm lying at that borderland where identity is lost. Now, I was very moved yesterday when Charles Correa gave an example uh, in Mumbai of uh, the kind of discussions that we had in uh, Johannesburg and Mexico City. He described something very simple, which is people of two different castes sitting down side by side in a, in a bus, piece of transport. People who normally wouldn't have been uh, in each other's presence. If, if you were an accurate, if I'm accurate in reporting you, you said that they, they didn't talk, but that they were with each other. And it's that kind of propinquity, which I think in urban design we need to search for. It means a profound change in mindset. Words like community become less important than words like recognition. It's a profound mindset. Um, it means, however, that we might begin to deal with the ultimate problem of inequality in cities, which is that as it's proceeded so far, inequality tends to produce a kind of economic, if not racial, apartheid. And designers can do something about that. We can do it by putting resources Design schools, health clinics, shopping malls, not in the center of places, but at their edge. We can't erase the inequality, but we can countervail against it. So, my third rule, for the third version of the Hippocratic group, is simply that contact matters more than identity. Um, so these are some thoughts I have as somebody involved in the practice of urban planning and urban design about how, by observing these three rules, these three Hippocratic rules, we might at least sensitize ourselves to the fact that the modern city, globalized city, tends increasingly to forms of inequality 
which segregate, which separate, and which render, as we, uh, the word that was used this morning, which render the mass of people invisible <coughs> to those who have power. Correspondingly, those who have power are not taking responsibility for the conditions of the city as a whole. That is the problem of capitalist inequality today. We can't solve it, but by becoming sensitive, we can countervail against it a little, and certainly we can do no harm. Thank you very much.